Take that quintessential object of the industrial age, the gun. The gun was one of the first things to be manufactured out of interchangeable, standardized parts. Take one apart, and the parts fit perfectly into another of the same type. What did this mean? It meant that we'd taken the first step on the road to uniformity, and not just in guns. The second wave of change not only standardized products, it molded us to fit into a mass society. A world of repetitive work, of identical products and images, of skyscrapers, factories, and commuters. Standardization became a way of life. Synchronization, another principle of industrial life. Millions of people sharing a common rhythm. And if some archaeologist of tomorrow found a watch, it would tell a lot about what makes us tick. For the watch maintains the rhythm of nine to five. All mass societies are not only standardized, they are synchronized. Yet everyone hates the nine to five. The wealth of nations, of which this is a first edition, begins with a famous passage. In it, he says, the greatest improvements in the productive powers of labor seem to have been the effects of the division of labor. And the example he gave was that of the pin. The important business of making a pin, he wrote, is divided into about 18 distinct operations. By dividing the task among many workers, Smith said, greater productivity could be achieved. Adam Smith used the pin to reveal another aspect of the hidden code of industrial society, specialization or the division of labor. The basic code of mass society ran through every aspect of life. This popular amusement park in Vienna, for example, is a place where people come to enjoy themselves, to get away from the factory and the office, to bring their children on a Sunday afternoon. But Potter Park is special. It boasts the world's biggest Ferris wheel. And big is what second wave civilization was all about. From the earliest days of the industrial era, all of us were inculcated with the idea that heroic scale, sheer size, had something to do with virtue. The French rushed out and built the Eiffel Tower. The Americans, the Empire State Building. The British, the Queen Mary, and then the Queen Elizabeth. And the Soviets, well, there's a story about Stalin, that he used to call in his experts and say to them, what's the biggest steel mill in the world? Build me a bigger one. What's the biggest hydroelectric dam in the world? I want a bigger one. Hand in hand with the idea of bigness came another basic principle. Alexander Hamilton in the American colonies called for the centralization of political power. He wanted a strong central government for the United States. Later, at this very desk, in the reading room of the library of the British Museum in London, a German emigre named Karl Marx called for the decisive centralization of power in the hands of the state. In capitalist as well as communist industrial nations, power flowed to the center. The power of the state, the power of money. This concentration of power was parallel by the concentration of energy, the concentration of production, and even the concentration of people. Take Toffler's main notion here, that there are specific aspects. You get standardized. I mean, this is, by the way, covered in, in uh, uh, Kessler's Darkness at Noon, where he says that in order to get people who are used to the agriculture era, where you work from can to can, 
What's the term can to can't mean? When you can't see when you can't see. When does, a, when does a farmer work during the harvest season? From can to can. However, when you get here, two things happen. First of all, since you now have electric lights or you had gas lights in the 19th century, there's no can't. You cannot regulate your life by can to can't. There's a second thing. Since you want a lot of people to work simultaneously, they have to arrive at a fixed time, right? Well, here, you had uh, no watches, no clocks. They were basically irrelevant. Here, they become very important. And, and Kessler said, in the early parts of the Stalinist period, you shot the worker who was late as a way of instructing the community. But the question is, how do you make this transition? How many of you wear a watch? Raise your hand. OK? Totally a second wave. Nobody in the agriculture would have understood. Not that they didn't, to some extent, keep time. The Romans invent uh, sundials. They, calendars. they had calendars, <laughs> but they had broader senses of time. See you around sundown. <coughs> around sundown. They measured by moons. Yeah. Just, but just think about, think about the difference in rhythms here and in specificity. Standardization. Uh, as late as the 1890s, one of the things that makes Henry Ford a genius is that he focuses on the standardized car. Because while we had had uh, the development of, of standardized uh, gun making uh, as early as about 1807, we really don't get, and Eli Whitney did it. Eli Whitney, in addition to inventing the cotton gin, invented the standardized uh, manufacturing for guns. You don't get to a standardized automobile to Henry Ford. I mean, what they built prior to Henry Ford was cars which would fit together individually. But you couldn't take that car apart and the car next to it apart and get them to fit together. Ford is a maniac. People thought he was crazy because he's focused on specialization. And that's the, the great breakthrough of, of the assembly line, is getting manufacturers who will give you parts that are carefully enough built that they are interchangeable. Because you can't have an assembly line to have interchangeable parts. Now, all of a sudden, that begins to disappear. And what, what I want you to understand is, as you go through each of these waves of change, each time you're going through a wave of change, civilizational change goes through every society as a wave which affects every aspect of life. Economics, politics, family structure, religion, the structure of society and power, government, and military power and warfare. So you can literally take this list, and we'll come back to it in the second hour. You can take this list and you can say, okay, tell me about economics in the agricultural age. Tell me about economics in the industrial age. Tell me about economics here. Tell me about the structure of family. What's family like if you're a hunter-gatherer? What's family like if you're in an agricultural society? How does family change here and how does it change here? And you begin to get very different patterns through all of the manifestations of life. Now, to give you an example, which is, I think, uh, absolutely fascinating, which Toffler did, and, and this is, comes out of a TV show that Alvin and Heidi did about uh, 10 years ago. To give you an example of how these changes permeate everything, I want you to look at what Alvin Toffler calls the music factory, remembering that the characteristics here are standardization, synchronization, people organized, and you might think about classes you've been in show up at the same time, sit in the same desk, face forward, do the same thing, take the test at the same time. And I want you to look at what he calls the music factory. 